there are no perfect exams, number one. And number two, no matter how clear, clear you think something is, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's understood clearly. So the fewer the questions, the better uh, in that sense. And so I hope that that went well. Um, I talked to the TA actually over the lunch hour, and things look, look like they're in pretty good shape. So I'm anticipating that they will be ready tomorrow. I don't know that. And like I said, I will put an email out, email message out about the exam uh, as soon as it's available for pickup. But my, my hope is that that will be then. Yes, ma'am? You'll, you'll, you'll pick it up from the biochem office, which is ALS 2011, and I'll put that information in the, in the email. Do you want to post the grade somewhere so that the individual yes. wanted to see where grades? Yes. So what I will do is, uh, what I typically do when I get the thing is that one of the first things I do is I compile all the grades, I do a plot of the grades, and then I post that on the schedule page. So if you look on the schedule page, you'll see a link, you'll see who, not who, but you'll see what the high score was, you'll see what the low score was, and you'll see the average, and then you'll also see the distribution of letter grades and you can look up your letter grade according to that. Okay? Clear as mud? Ready to dive in again? Yep. Is that a yes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever gets you through the hour, whatever gets you through the two hours is fine with me. So <laughs> it certainly sounds good to me. So I think the older I've gotten, the more I have discovered that if I drink something, I don't care what it is, it's not alcohol or anything, if I just drink something, I get the hiccups. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's true. So you can look forward to this happening more. How about <laughs> Although I do wonder what's in that thing. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've, we're actually in very good shape uh, time-wise. And uh, so I'm going through things I know fairly rapidly, but we're very much on target for where we need to be to um, get through all the material. One of the challenges for me uh, in teaching this course is, of course, um, the, the course has a fixed endpoint. Next term, Dr. Merrill will be uh, teaching the course, and he'll have a place where he's going to start. So if I don't get you that endpoint by the time he's ready to start, then there's a gap. I think I've mentioned that, and that's, that's a problem. It's not so much of a problem for me when I do the um, fall and winter, because I teach the fall, then I follow it up with the winter. So if there's some reason I don't have a, the gap covered, then I just make sure it gets covered the next time. So anyway, but I think we're in very good shape with stuff. Okay, well, uh, you guys are probably going to think that you're really getting tired of proteins, but of course, uh, proteins are the core of biochemistry. You've seen something uh, about general structure. You saw that at four levels. You've uh, now seen uh, something about mechanism of catalytic action. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about regulatory strategies. And regulatory strategies are very, very important for proteins because um, as I noted in the example the other day of the Porsche, driving the Porsche to Fred Meyer, if we're not careful, um, enzymes uh, can cause problems because cells sometimes have to make uh, certain metabolites. Other times, cells have to break those metabolites down. And being able to control that by a cell is very, very critical for a cell to be able to respond to its environment. And I can't emphasize that enough. I keep coming back to responding to its environment. Everything that we see built into the uh, machinery and the mechanisms of the cell are all directed at allowing the cell to respond to its environment. And you might think, okay, well, here's the environment. It's warm, it's cold, et cetera. But the environment is, includes what level of energy it has, what uh, amount of nutrients it has available to it, what the pH is, temperature, all the other things we associate with that. And what demands are being placed on that cell if it's in a multicellular organism by other cells in the body. And so all of these are factors and because we have specialized organs like liver, like muscle, like bone, uh, et cetera, we have uh, specialized needs for all those as well. The liver, as we will see, is a pretty important organ in terms of um, responding to and helping the rest of the body to meet uh, various metabolic needs. And so the, ultimately, the control of these has to happen at the level of the proteins. Um, and even prior to that, it has to happen at the level of nucleic acids. But for right now, we're concerned about the level of controlling those proteins. So with that uh, sort of introduction, that's why regulation is important. You're going to see that when I talk about metabolic pathways later in the term, and when Dr. Merrill talks about metabolic pathways next term, that regulation of those pathways are going to be major fo uh, focuses, foci, of um, those of our understanding of those, because we have to do we have to know more than simply what goes to what goes to what goes to what, but we have to know under what conditions what goes to what and how those conditions change influences whether or not the pathway works. We're going to see the very first of that today, actually. <laughs>
So um, I want to start by talking about an enzyme that is uh, one of the more studied enzymes that's out there. It's called aspartate transcarbamylase, which is a mouthful of a name. You're much more likely to call it ATCase. Okay? So ATCase is uh, an enzyme. And you'll notice I said earlier in the term, whenever you see the letters ASE on the end, that refers to uh, an enzyme. So we see the ASE on the end. We know we have an enzyme. And what you see on the screen is the reaction that this enzyme uh, catalyzes. Um, you'll notice I didn't put any names up there. And my um, interest in this enzyme isn't so much the reactions that it catalyzes, but more how this enzyme is regulated and how that regulation relates to the overall metabolic pathway that's there. And I, I hope to um, uh, make this importance clear to you in, in a bit. One of the metabolite, or one of the precursors, that is one of the substrates that the enzyme uses in this reaction is aspartate, which is aspartic acid, which um, is uh, an amino acid, obviously. And uh, it's part of what gives the enzyme its name. Uh, as I said, I'm not really so much concerned about that. I only mention it because you will see aspartate uh, coming up when I talk about it later. But rather, what, where this enzyme fits in a metabolic pathway. So I haven't talked about metabolic pathways yet. And I need to uh, sort of clarify that term because we do uh, frequently just bandy that term about. Metabolism, of course, is the um, sum of the chemical reactions that go on inside of a cell. Metabolism is the sum of the chemical reactions that go on inside of a cell. Virtually every chemical reaction that occurs in a cell, I said virtually, not every one, but virtually every one, is catalyzed by an enzyme. And that's partly because cells are control freaks. The more they can control of those chemical reactions going on inside of them, the better they are able to manipulate things and respond to their environment. Okay. So cells use enzymes to do metabolism. When we look at uh, metabolism, what we discover is that these reactions that are occurring in the cell aren't just randomly organized and this is converting into this and that's the end of it, but in fact they are uh, occurring in sequence. So metabolic um, reactions will, or what are called pathways, will frequently involve molecule one is the product of the first reaction and it's the precursor of, this, of the next reaction in the pathway. And that produces molecule two that is the product of the second reaction and it's the precursor for um, the uh, third reaction of the pathway. Um, we'll see later this term, we'll see glycolysis, which uh, consists of 10 reactions in sequence, in which glucose is converted through 10 different reactions to two molecules of pyruvate. All right? And those are sequential. I emphasize the sequential nature of those. Each of those reactions depends upon the one preceding it. And that um, link, or that series that we see of reactions in metabolism, is very, very useful for control purposes. Okay? It's very, very useful for control purposes. So when I'm talking about metabolic pathways, I'm talking about a series of connected reactions. They're connected in, just like I said, molecule one is the precursor for molecule two is the precursor for molecule three, et cetera. Yes, sir? What? Yeah, so the, the question is, what's the general yield in these reactions? So the general yield in these reactions is solely a product, a product uh, solely a function of the concentration of the precursors, okay? So we're not talking about a chemical reaction where we have some, you know, byproducts and so forth that are made. We're talking about only uh, basically 100%, if you want to think about it in that way, as long as we have enough precursors to go. And that's actually a good question in the sense that um, what we discover in the cell is the driving force for metabolism is concentration. Cells really respond to concentration. We'll see why that is when I talk later about uh, the delta G of these uh, reactions. But concentration drives everything ultimately. Okay, well, so that's a mouthful of stuff to get started about for what looks like a very simple reaction on the screen. I'm not interested in your knowing the names of these compounds. I'm not even interested in your knowing the structure. But there is something on this screen that I have that I haven't talked about that's very important. 
you see that this is the product of this uh, molecule, uh, of this uh, enzy enzymatic reaction right here. We see there's a rearrangement actually that's happening. So we make this plus this. Doesn't really matter. This guy right here is a precursor of, um, ultimately, of a um, um, molecule known as CTP. CTP is, of course, a ribonucleotide. All right? So um, ATCAs is essentially catalyzing the first step in a pathway that leads to CTP. It's the first step in a pathway that leads to CTP. Now, 10 is almost a magic number in biochemistry because there's about 10 steps that lead to CTP. They don't have an arrow for every one of them up here that leads to this. Dr. Merrill will talk about nucleotide metabolism next term, and you'll see uh, this overall. You'll see this enzyme again, is I guess what I'm telling you. Well, why do I care about the fact that this is a pathway, number one, and that uh, ATCase is the first enzyme in this pathway? Well, if you remember the very first thing I said, that we're concerned about regulation. And when we think about regulation, we have to think of regulation not so much of individual reactions as much as we do pathways. Because it turns out that regulating pathways is an extraordinarily efficient way for cells to go. Cells may have on the order of several hundred to several thousand enzymes, depending upon what they're doing. Okay? And not every enzyme is not efficient, it's not effective to have regulation built into every enzyme. Instead, cells typically, it's not absolute, but cells typically have regulation built into the critical enzymes of pathways. Okay? So that's what we see here. ATCase turns out to be a regulatory enzyme. It can be controlled by external things. That's what a regulated enzyme is. It's controlled by external things. What does that mean? Well, briefly, I told you the other day that allosterism, or an allosteric uh, uh, enzyme, is an enzyme that is controlled by the binding of a small molecule to it. Okay? It's controlled by the binding of a small molecule to it. The small molecule that controls ATCase, or we'll see there's actually three of them, but one of the three is the end product of this pathway, which is CTP. Now, this is a common mechanism that cells use to regulate pathways. It's called feedback inhibition. And I'll tell you why that's the case in just a second. Feedback inhibition. Well, feedback is, as you can imagine, something out there coming back and, and giving you more. If you have feedback on your um, microphone with your amplifier, you get some rather obnoxious noise uh, that can happen uh, associated with that. And if you have feedback of a metabolic pathway, the accumulation of the product makes it more likely that it's going to bind to the first enzyme in the pathway. Now, we're interested in making the proper amount of CTP in the cell. We're interested in making the proper amount of any uh, metabolite in the cell. But it turns out with nucleotides, it's, it's even more important because if we make too much of a given nucleotide, we, may, we sort of doom the cell to mutation. Right? So cells are very, 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 in fact, they're probably more careful with nucleotides than they are with any other metabolite in the cell. They're more careful about controlling the levels of these nucleotides because they don't want to have mutation occurring any more than necessary. Well, this is a very simple but effective mechanism because if CTP binds to ATCase, what it does is it stops the first reaction in the path. If you stop the first reaction, the first product isn't made, therefore the second product isn't made, therefore the third product isn't made, therefore the fourth product isn't made, and therefore <coughs> you, have, you have effectively shut down the pathway. That's very, very simple. It's very, very effective. When CTP gets to a certain level, it turns off its own synthesis, in, in essence. Now, I use the term off and on. And you'll hear me do this in the rest of the term. And you'll hear most biochemists talking about these things as if they're off or on. Most regulatory schemes are not absolute off or on. They're more like the volume control on your stereo. Okay? We can think of on as being high. <laughs> And we can think of off as being low. So in essence, what CTP is doing is it's turning down or slowing down the enzyme 
so that it's making less CTP. And most regulatory pathways do that. There are some that are absolute, but this is not one that is. Allosteric pathways are not absolute. They tend to have the volume turned down. That turning down the volume can be very effective. It can slow the synthesis of CTP down considerably. Okay, so feedback inhibition is a very, very important mechanism for controlling enzymes. Feedback inhibition always occurs allosterically. Now, you might wonder what that means because allosterism is the only mechanism I've described so far to control enzymes. But we're going to see today that there is one other mechanism I'll talk about today. It's called covalent modification. And there's a third mechanism that's uh, involved in cells, and that's whether or not an enzyme is made. And though I know you're thinking, duh, that's, uh, that sort of makes sense, it's a very effective mechanism. If you want an on-off mechanism, this probably doesn't get any better than that. If you don't make the enzyme, it's kind of hard to have the reaction go. Okay, so CTP is um, a, a, an excellent example of an enzyme that is regulated, okay? Well, CTP is, is studied for more reasons than that, as we shall see, okay? There's the actual reaction if you want to memorize names or any of that. We see the several arrows over here uh, leading ultimately to um, CTP, which is down there. So you might imagine that there's quite a bit that has to happen between getting to the, from this guy all the way down here to this guy, and there is. There's our friend aspartate and the various intermediates uh, that are there. By the way, most of the, not most, all of the nucleotides have at least one or two amino acids as their precursors. We know that the chemistry that was necessary to make nucleotides exists in outer space. It's all over. So it's not complicated uh, mechanisms that's necessary to synthesize nucleotides. Okay. Um, this figure, uh, the only message to take uh, out of this is uh, what I told you briefly earlier, that we don't turn the volume off, we turn the volume down. We see that on the y-axis we are plotting the, basically the velocity of the reaction. On the x-axis we are plotting the uh, concentration of CTP. And we see that as CTP concentration increases, it does turn the enzyme down, but it doesn't turn it all the way off. Okay, now, when we look at um, the enzyme ATCase, we discover something else that's kind of odd. And this is, an, uh, this is a sort of an unusual thing uh, for uh, an enzyme. And this enzyme, um, if we measure that same velocity of the uh, enzyme on the y-axis, as we did on the, on the previous one, but now we measure it compared to the concentration of aspartate, Okay. We see something that looks kind of like hemoglobin looked like, right? We see that binding that looks like hemoglobin. In fact, what we see is a sigmoidal plot. Okay. This tells us that this enzyme is doing something odd. This enzyme is, in fact, having its activity affected by its substrate. And it's being affected very positively, very much like we saw hemoglobin's cooperativity ex uh, working. Okay? So this, when we see an enzyme's activity showing a sigmoidal, and they, they, they could probably emphasize this sigmoidal nature a little better than they did here. But uh, nonetheless, when you see a sigmoidal plot uh, for an enzyme, you can say, oh, this enzyme is allosteric. That's a, that's a real good clue that you have an allosteric enzyme. Okay? Well, this means that we, you, you said, well, you already knew it was allosteric, but remember, the allosterism I was talking before had to do with CTP. What I'm talking about here is actually with respect to a substrate. This substrate is affecting this enzyme's activity. So in addition to CTP turning this enzyme down, aspartate is turning this enzyme now, there are those who will quibble with the nature of allosteric, uh, saying that it really has to mean something besides a substrate. Um, that's a matter of splitting hairs as far as I'm concerned. The substrate here is affecting the enzyme's activity, and for our purposes, we will describe this as being allosteric. Now, so the enzyme is interesting. Allo uh, plenty of aspartic acid is turning it on. Now, it turns out that at the level of the cell, you might, well, why, why does the cell have this sort of a mechanism? And uh, why should it care how much aspartate it has? Why should aspartate be turning the enzyme on? 
Well, I'll remind you that when cells have to divide, cells have to um, make a lot of nucleotides. And making a lot of nucleotides, whether they're ribonucleotides or they're deoxyribonucleotides, and by the way, the ribonucleotides are the precursors of the deoxyribonucleotides, whether a cell, um, when the cell makes the decision to divide, it has to assess a lot of things. It has to know, do I have enough resources to make the things I need to divide? Do I have enough resources? Do I have enough energy to do that? Okay. Two things that it asks. Well, one of the resources that cells need to divide is aspartic acid because it's, they have to make proteins. So it turns out that aspartic acid gives a simple way of assessing, well, what's our level of material that we need to uh, go forward? If there's not much aspartic acid, this enzyme is going to be down over here, and we're not going to see much activity going on. That cell is going to say, whoa, we are not going to divide. We're not ready. We don't have the stuff that we need to go forward. All right. So that turns out to be a very, very useful uh, uh, entity for the, the cell to use as a signaling uh, molecule. Okay. Now, ATCase, uh, I'm going to jump ahead, well, jump ahead here, um, is an enzyme with a very uh, interesting structure. You saw hemoglobin, for example, had four subunits, two identical alpha subunits and two identical beta subunits. Um, uh, uh, ATCase has a more complicated structure. It actually has 12 subunits. And the subunits are in two classes. The one class of subunit is what you see uh, described in the middle in yellow as a catalytic trimer. And you also see three um, uh, sets of pairs of regulatory dimers. So basically two classes of subunits, regulatory subunits and catalytic subunits. Now it turns out there's two catalytic trimers. They're showing you the view from the top here. So underneath here will be three more catalytic subunits. And the three are identical. And the regulatory subunits are identical. And so now we see that same thing from the side. Instead of seeing it from the top, there's the three, there's the three there. So in essence, we have six catalytic subunits and we have six regulatory subunits comprising this 12 subunit enzyme. As their name would suggest, the regulatory subunits bind regulatory molecules. There's an exception to that. Okay, I'll give you that in a second. CTP is one of those regulatory molecules. It do, it's not a part of the reaction. And by the way, keep in mind, I want you to remember this. Students frequently confuse this. CTP is not a product of the enzyme. It's a product of the pathway, many steps away from the enzyme. It's not what the enzyme makes. But instead, several more reactions are necessary before CTP is made. So CTP has nothing to do with the reaction. CTP binds to the regulatory uh, subunit. And when it binds to the regulatory subunit, as we will see, it induces a change in the enzyme. So the enzyme's shape changes as a result of that. Well, aspartate is a, uh, a notable exception to this. Aspartate is, in fact, a substrate. And aspartate binds to the catalytic site. So not all of these regulatory molecules are binding to the regulatory subunits. And yes, there is one more regulatory molecule I'll talk about in just a second. OK. Now, I've sort of set the stage by saying that the binding of the regulatory molecules, whether they're binding to the regulatory subunit or they're binding to the catalytic subunit, the binding of those regulatory molecules induces a change in shape in the enzyme. We've talked earlier about R states and T states. And in fact, what's happening is the enzyme is being converted when it's being turned on from the T state into the R state. And when it's being turned off, it's being converted from the R state into the T state. Okay? So the R state, I will remind you, is what we would describe as the relaxed state. That's the state at which it binds substrate effectively. Is, uh, it, it's most effective as an enzyme. It was the R state of hemoglobin. That was the one that bound to oxygen the uh, strongest. The T state was the form that let go of oxygen. It didn't like to bind to oxygen nearly as much. And the T state of this enzyme is the state in which the enzyme uh, does not uh, catalyze a reaction very effectively because it doesn't bind to substrate very effectively. 
Okay. Well, this was all discovered, um, what you see here, as a result of study of this enzyme with an interesting molecule. All right. The interesting molecule that was used to study this enzyme is, an, is a man-made molecule called Pala. I always call it Pala. I couldn't even tell you what the name is, so I won't expect you to tell me what the name is. All right. Um, Pala, and I, again, I see, notice I said this is a man-made molecule. This is not a natural substrate of this enzyme. Right? Pala acts like a suicide inhibitor of the enzyme. Acts like a suicide inhibitor. If you remember what a suicide inhibitor was, a suicide inhibitor looked like the natural substrate that the enzyme binds to. It's not identical to it, but it's similar enough to it that the enzyme binds it, and when it binds to it, it, it the enzyme uh, is covalently attached to the suicide inhibitor, and the enzyme is knocked out of the water. Okay? So, well, the reason I mention this is when people started studying this enzyme, they discovered that when they treated the enzyme with Pala, that they could actually lock it into a form. It was a form they didn't know existed very much because they had hints back here in the centrifuge that the molecule, that, I'm sorry, that the enzyme, if we didn't do anything to disrupt it, came out as one peak. But if we disrupted it, we could see regulatory peaks and we could see catalytic peaks. This guy over here actually could look different in the centrifuge if it was locked in the R versus the T. So this would look like a couple of bumps if we have R and T there. But for the most part, the enzyme in the absence of Pala was existing in the T state. If you take the just plain old enzyme and you put it there, you end up with something like 80 to 1 um, of the enzyme favored in the T state over the R state. But when they treated it with Pala, they had a much larger percentage of the enzyme that showed up in this new state. And this new state, they realized, was an R state. So Pala, what it was doing was it was binding to the catalytic subunit, just like aspartate would. Pala looks like aspartate. But instead of allowing the reaction to proceed, Pala became attached to the enzyme. And notably, the enzyme, when it became attached to it, was in the R state. And so now it became quite apparent that what aspartate was doing was it was converting the enzyme into the R state. And that's why we saw this favored uh, reaction velocity. That's why they had that S-shaped curve. If we had low concentrations of aspartate, very little of it in the, S, in the R state, and therefore much reduced uh, enzyme velocity. So Pala gave very important clues to uh, what the enzyme was actually doing. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, uh, all right, so now this figure uh, shows us um, visually what's happening to this enzyme when Paul is bound to it. If I just simply take and I put aspartate in there, remember aspartate is a substrate and the enzyme keeps catalyzing the reaction, once it lets go of aspartate, it may not stay in that R state. And so the R state becomes much easier to study if we can freeze the enzyme in that state, which is what happens with the suicide inhibitor, Pala. Well, suffice it to say that Pala locks the enzyme in this state. You see a Pala here. You see a Pala. There's actually a Pala on every one of these guys here. And the bottom line is that the enzyme is more open. And that more open nature of the enzyme is important because the substrate binding sites are more readily accessible when it's loosened up and open than it is when the enzyme is in the T state when there's no such substrate there. Yes, sir? Quick question. So Paul is not really an inhibitor then? You said it acts like a suicide inhibitor, but it doesn't really inhibit anything? So, Paula is a suicide inhibitor. All suicide inhibitors will kill the enzyme. So the enzyme is completely inhibited when it's full of Pala. But I thought we said the R state is when it's the most active. Correct. Okay. And Pala is converting it and locking it into the R state. Uh -huh. So the R state we see is a, it's a good question. The R state is a structural thing. And it's that structural thing that we associate with higher activity. If Pala were not there and we had the enzyme in the R state, it would be catalyzing like crazy. Okay. But very good question. So I don't know if you heard the question or not, but the question was, um, Pala is killing the enzyme, but you said it's in the R state. You said the R state's the most active state. 
And my answer was that the R state is a structural feature, and we associate that structural feature with, uh, in fact, a, uh, an improved ability to catalyze a reaction. So aspartate does exactly the same thing to this enzyme. Okay? Binding of one aspartate favors the binding of another aspartate, favors the binding of another aspartate, just like we saw in hemoglobin binding oxygen. And the more favorable that binding is, the faster the reactions can be catalyzed. Pala is just a, an aberrant one in that sense, in that it's locking that enzyme into um, the R state, but it's not catalyzing it. Your question actually brings up something that I think is one of the problems that I assigned in the book for you to uh, practice on. Okay? Uh, it's a, it's an, it's a uh, problem that I uh, uh, have in the past asked on midterm exams, and I'll ask it to the class here since we've got a little bit of time. Okay? So Pala is a, um, an, a suicide inhibitor. It kills the enzyme. Okay? What people studying Pala discovered was that if they took and they treated the enzyme with an abundant quantity of Pala, that in fact the enzyme was dead. But if they treated the enzyme with a small amount of Pala, the enzyme was even more active. The question is, why? Anisia? You're close. You're close. You're on the right track. So uh, ex maybe you could elaborate a little bit more. Um, kind of like hemoglobin, where if one oxygen binds, yep. then a whole bunch of more oxygen can bind to it. Yep. OK. So why does Paula, in other words, how is Paula able to do that? It, 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 we, said it was, we said it was a suicide inhibitor. But it's not inhibiting the whole thing. It's only part of it. Excellent. OK. So what happens is, in low concentrations, not all six subunits get bound by Pala. So if you only get one or two bound, the entire enzyme is locked in the R state. Well, now it's sitting there. It's active as all get out. When it, when it catalyzes it re its reaction, it doesn't have any desire or ability to even go back to the T state. It just stays where it is and keeps catalyzing reaction, keeps catalyzing reaction. You go to a higher concentration of Pala, of course, you fill up all the subunits. And then the enzyme has no opportunity to do that. OK, very good. All right, oh, did it again. There we go. Too much idle bumping there. All right, so this figure, which I think is a little confusing, I'll show you. But it shows us um, what the nature of the sigmoidal uh, curve is that we see for this enzyme. If the enzyme behaves simply as a, um, as a, um, uh, non-allosteric enzyme, we would see a hyperbolic plot like we saw with myoglobin. However, when we um, uh, have multiple subunits, and by the way, multiple subunits are a re requirement for an allosteric enzyme, just like multiple subunits were a requirement for cooperativity, so too there are a requirement for allosterism. If the enzyme existed solely in the R state, which is what uh, it would exist if it didn't have an allosteric nature, or if it existed in simply a T state, which is what it would be if we had it all turned down, we would see either this velocity or this velocity. And in fact, what we see is that the S plot arises from the sum of these two. This figure doesn't show it very well, but that's basically why we have an S plot. It tells us that the enzyme can exist in two different states. And as the concentration of aspartate gets higher, it's much more likely it will pop into the R state and we see that basically happening up here. At lower concentrations, we see less of it in the R state. We see more in the T state. And that's why it pops down here. So that's uh, a nice visual. I shouldn't say nice, but it's, it's a, a reasonable visual uh, display of why we see that sigmoidal plot when we have um, uh, allosterism. OK, so now CTP, I said, binds to the um, regulatory subunits. And what CTP does is it basically locks the enzyme in the T state. Now, I'm going to tell you a mechanism in a minute for us to consider that, that will uh, explain this. But it locks it in the T state. Locks in the T state, though it can still catalyze a little bit of a reaction. The reaction is considerably slower. And the enzyme is effectively shut off when CTP is present. OK. Now. Um, it turns out that 
One of the mechanisms for explaining how ATCase is controlled involves um, the enzyme's ability on its own to flip between R state and T state. The way I've been describing this so far, you've probably envisioned this as, well, binding of aspartate causes the enzyme to go into the R state, or binding of CTP causes the enzyme to go into the T state. But in fact, it doesn't have to be a cause effect. Well, how does that happen? Well, I'm going to present to you here another way of explaining this. And my reason for, ex for explaining these in both ways is that enzymes, some enzymes use one mechanism, some enzymes use other mechanism, and some use a sort of a combination of the two. All right. So one model is a cause effect. Binding of, a, of, a, of a, an allosteric effector causes a change. A good example of that was hemoglobin. We saw that the binding of one oxygen did cause the hemoglobin to change shape, cause things to happen. Okay. The other model is a, um, and by the way, that model is called a sequential model. A sequential model says that there's a cause effect. Binding of one molecule causes a shape change in the protein that binds to it. There's a separate model, and but ATCAs is actually more consistent with that separate model in which the enzyme, it's called, this, back up, this other model is called the concerted model. Okay. The concerted model says that there's not a cause and effect with respect to the binding of the allosteric effector. There's not a cause and effect with respect to the allosteric effector. Well, how does the enzyme flip to R and T state? The concerted model says that the enzyme flips on its own independent of the allosteric molecule. So the flipping between R and T is not caused by the CTP. It's not caused by the aspartate. But the enzyme flips between these two on its own all the time if neither one of them are there. So the enzyme is partly in the T state. The enzyme is partly in the R state. It turns out it's actually um, we know it's, it, it, it tends to be in the T state much more than it is in the R state. But that this flipping between the two is just a property of the enzyme. Okay? So how, do, how does aspartate and CTP play into this? Well, it turns out that if the enzyme is in the T state, CTP can bind and lock it in that state. So CTP is preventing the enzyme from flipping on its own. So the concerted model says there's not a cause and effect. The enzyme flips on its own, and the binding of an allosteric molecule to it locks the enzyme in whatever state it was in. So the T state will bind to CTP, and, hold, and then CTP will just hold it there in that state. Aspartate, if it binds to this in the R state, will hold it in that state. And we can see here why the multiple subunits make a lot of sense now. This is being held when it's holding on to an aspartate, allowing another aspartate to come in here, 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 etc. Binding of one is favoring the immediate flip into the binding of the others. OK, now, the concerted model is usually the one that students have a harder time grasping, OK, because Maybe because of the way I've taught it, but because we start thinking about these as the cause and effect. But the concerted model and the sequential model are equivalent, I shouldn't say they're equivalent, but they are equivalent ways of explaining allosterism, and some enzymes tend to use one versus the other. So ATCase tends, uh, as, as best we can tell, to use the concerted model. It tends to flip on its own, and then what locks it? into place, it depends upon what, what binds it at, at that given time. Questions on that? Yes? So um, can the substrate bind to it while in the T state and then lock it in and CTP in the So, so I, I think your question is, can aspartate bind in the T state and, and, and do something? And is it kind of lock it in, or is it, yeah. is that right? No. So, so, so first of all, it's, it's a good question, but first of all, the um, um, aspartate can bind 
to the enzyme in the T-stem. Remember, we had a lowered velocity. So it can still bind, we can still have a little bit of reaction going on. But aspartate cannot lock it into that state, and it can't, can't cause it to change. If it's been blocked in that T-state by CTP, for example, aspartate is just going to come in, it's going to have a slow reaction, and it's going to leave. The only place where aspartate can lock anything in is if it binds to the enzyme in the R-state. Okay? Yes? Uh, how many ingredients does it have to bind to lock it in? Uh, as far as I know, only one. Okay, so now we can see, that, again, the abundance of aspartate, the abundance of CTP are having effects on this enzyme. And uh, ultimately, again, controlling whether this enzyme is on or off. The concerted model and the sequential models, as I said, both uh, very nicely explain what happens with various uh, enzymes. All right. This simply shows us what happens if we follow the velocity of the reaction as a function of aspartate concentration when we have either no amount of, of CTP or some CTP, okay? We see the velocity goes down if CTP is present, and that's consistent with what we were talking about before. That is that the enzyme does not um, um, exhibit uh, as much velocity as it did uh, earlier. Now, a very interesting phenomenon is also known with this enzyme, and it's shown right here. If we do the same reaction, and instead of having uh, CTP in there, we put ATP in there, we actually see the velocity of the enzyme increases. The velocity of the enzyme increases. Now, when you see something like that, what would be your interpretation? Yes? Uh, that ATP is more energetically favorable. It is more energetically favorable, but it actually compared to CTP, no, it's not. So it's not, it's not energy, no. There's a, there's a, there's a more basic um, explanation. Is the what? The no, not quite. Uh, if you have a lot of ATP without any CTP, you need to be able to produce more to keep it in balance. Um, if you make it more AT, have more ATP than CTP that needs it to keep it in balance? Um, the answer is that's actually partly true for why, but it doesn't explain the phenomenon itself. Affinity? No. You guys are all doing the hard answers. The answer is that ATP is also an allosteric effector. Okay? And that comes back to your point here, as I'll explain in, in a second, but ATP also is an allosteric effector. So ATP will bind to the regulatory subunit just like CTP will bind to the regulatory subunit. However, if ATP binds to it, it locks the enzyme into the R state. And now the enzyme is off and running. Now, what, what is your name? Evan. Evan. What Evan said is a very important um, aspect of the enzyme. Remember I said that the cell has to have a balance of nucleotides present, okay? CTP is a pyrimidine, okay? CTP is made from UTP in this pathway. So basically we're talking about the pathway that makes pyrimidines. ATP is a purine. Cells want to have balance. If we have too many purines, we want to turn on pyrimidine synthesis. That balance is actually realized because of this allosteric property of the enzyme. Pyrimidine synthesis is going to be turned on when purine concentration is high. Pyrimidine synthesis is going to be turned off when pyrimidine concentration is high. Cells have reached a balance here. That's very, very cool. Now, there's one other cool thing about this, and it relates to the things that all of you were sort of trying to address, which is energy, okay? ATP is, in fact, the major energy source of the cell. It doesn't have any more energy than CTP does, but it's the main one that the cells use to do what they do, okay? Remember that what cells are trying to decide is, should I divide or should I not divide, ultimately? 
Well, I said that there were two things that cells wanted to read the barometer of before they made that decision to divide. One was the um, uh, supply of nutrients that they had, one of which was aspartate. The other is what's their energy level? And the energy level is measured by the concentration of ATP. When the concentration of ATP is high, you're favoring pyrimidine synthesis also so that you can now get ready to make a whole bunch of nucleotides, so you can make DNA and RNA. So this measuring or monitoring the concentration of ATP, which is essentially what's happening here, allows the cell to detect, are we okay to go or not okay to go? I think that, uh, and I, I don't, when I teach uh, BB451, I always tell students that you know, it's amazing the number of different regulatory controls there are into nucleotide metabolism. You're seeing two, about two and a half here, and there are about 10. They're really remarkable how much care the cell has built into balancing the relative amounts of the individual nucleotides that they make. So, all right, so that's what's happening uh, with uh, ATCAs. Let me see if I'm at a break point or if I'm not at a break point. I forget where I'm at. Okay, so let me just briefly show you these models. I've told, about, told them to you in words. Now I'll show them to you in uh, schematics. Whoop, that wasn't what I thought that was. Um, this is simply showing, okay, this is, this is bad. Uh, this is simply showing us um, what happens, it introduced, actually introduced a concept that I don't like to bring up, but I'll bring it up since I've already shown you the figure. Um, if we measure the ratio of T to R, you're not responsible for this, I'll just tell you this, so you can put your pens down, how about that? All right, if we measure the ratio of T to R in the cell, okay, the ratio of T to R in the cell is quite high. Cell, the, the R ATCAs tends to prefer the T state. If we have no, okay, we have no um, uh, allosteric effectors there, all right, the ratio of T to R is about 200 to 1. That's what the L is. Okay, and this figure is simply showing us how that ratio of T to R is changed by the allosteric effectors. If we add CTP, we increase the amount of T. It now goes to 1250 to 1. That's why we see much more of the enzyme turned off. If we convert the enzyme into the R state, or, uh, I shouldn't say convert, if we, if we treat the enzyme with ATP, which locks it in the R state, even there, we still see 70 to 1, okay, T to R. But we've made a big change in going from here to here. And so even though we still have, we're still greatly outnumbered by T, we still see that that, that velocity can increase um, and make a, a process uh, be much more favorable. Okay. All right, now. Um, I've got a bad link there because I thought there should be something else that showed you that, and um, I'll show you this. Okay, so what you see on the screen is a depiction of the sequential model. So I told you the sequential model, I told you the concerted model. I said ATCAs use the concerted model, and what this is showing us is what the sequential model looked like. It says that the binding of one, which we see here, causes others to start changing. They use the unfortunate designation of L there, which has nothing to do with the L we saw before. Binding of the second one favors the change of the third one. Binding of the third one changes the shape change of the fourth one. So we see a cause and effect. The binding of the, um, uh, the binding of the, um, yeah, what am I going to say? The binding of the, um, I can't, my mind is not working. Brain farts just happen in my head. <laughs> okay. Uh, the model is that the binding of one is causing the shape changes of the other, whereas this, uh, ATCAs is locking in one versus the other. The concerted model basically says that we are here or we are here. So it's flipping from one to the other, and that's um, what the concerted model says by contrast. Okay. Well, maybe that my brain is telling me it's time to give my brain a, re a rest. I will take that rest and give you guys a couple minutes of break and we'll come back and we'll talk now about another means of controlling enzymes, covalent modification.
Uh -huh. um, she actually is an administrator over at the Corvallis Clinic. Okay. And I was going to shadow her during the three-week gap that I have between the end of summer school and Good. after school. Good. And she was going to put me with like all sorts of doctors and herself so I could get the full visual of what runs, how a clinic runs. Excellent. Unfortunately, I've been trying to get a hold of this guy for two months, and it's just not happening, and okay. I'm getting kind of PO'd. Okay. So I kind of want to go to the dean uh -huh. and talk to the dean, but I don't know if that would So be this was res with respect to grade issue, wasn't it? No, no, no. He still hasn't resolved that, first off. Secondly, I took, um, it's like a practice. So that hasn't, that hasn't been fixed yet? No. And I've been trying to get a hold of, so. Okay.